Good evening. I'm Suzanne Stanis, Director of Heritage Education for Indiana Landmarks. And thanks for joining us for another installment of our How They Do That series, where we take an in-depth look at significant preservation projects. We're using the webinar version of Zoom, so please type your questions in the Q&A and we'll take as many as we can at the end of the program. All right, uh, you can see by the way I'm dressed that it's that time of year when my thoughts have turned to cars, especially fast ones, which Ford has certainly produced over the years. And even though the Fords that came off the Indianapolis assembly line in 1915 topped out at a whopping 45 miles per hour, they revolutionized American life by providing affordable transportation in sharp contrast to the Stutzes, Duesenbergs, and Marmons that were also made in Indiana. By 2016, when the Ford assembly plant landed on Indiana Landmark's 10 most endangered list, it was an industrial shell with little reference to the 600,000 cars and hundreds of employees that it, uh, it housed. I'm eager to see what it took to get it back on track. Our speakers tonight include Logan Cook, Julie Zent, and J.B. Curry. Logan Cook is a licensed professional engineer at West Channing Elsner Associates, where he's been for 12 years investigating, repairing, and restoring new and existing structures. His experience includes evaluating challenges and developing solutions related to facades, roofing, waterproofing, masonry, concrete, steel, and various structural systems. Logan also serves as a structure specialist on FEMA's Indiana Task Force One Urban Search and Rescue Team, and he's always a rapid responder to structural questions from Indiana Landmark staff. Julie Zint is a preservation specialist with Ratio and an alumni of Indiana Landmark's internship program. She brings over 15 years of experience, having worked on places as diverse as courthouses, houses of worship, hotels, and apartments, including the Kellington Cotton Mill Apartments, and the Elks Lodge Adaptive Reuse Apartments in Madison. Julie's broad experience includes everything from building assessments and national register nominations to complete renovations. She's active in professional and community organizations with a preservation focus, including Indiana Landmarks. J.B. Curry joined TWG in 2014 and serves as the Vice President of Market Rate Development. His role includes acquisitions and negotiations, pre-development due diligence, market research, financial feasibility, deal underwriting, and securing financing. JB also coordinates with design, pre-construction, construction, and management teams throughout the life of the project. Prior to joining TWG, JB practiced commercial and business litigation, as well as real estate transactions. In his spare time, he serves on the Penrod Society Committee supporting Indian artists. And we'd like to thank JB and the Penrod Society for all they do to support tonight's program. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. Logan, take it away. All right, thanks for, uh, thanks for having us. And uh, I can think of no better way to jumpstart uh, the Memorial Day weekend here in Indiana than talking about the Ford Assembly Building. Um, to start off, um, and, and just to confirm Suzanne and, and everybody that we're seeing our screen here, can I get a thumbs up? We're okay. Good. All right. Um, to, to start off, uh, I, I just wanna start off by saying that this, this project had a, a lot of design team members and uh, Julie and I were, were proud and, and honored to be part of that team, but we were only small parts of the team for this in, entire project that TWG put together. Uh, so there's a lot of recognition that goes around to, to some of the design team partners that we were uh, eager to work with on this project. What we're going to talk about today uh, is, is we're going to start off with a, a brief history of the building that, that Julie will, will discuss. And then JB is going to talk about the redevelopment concepts and challenges with redeveloping this, this uh, historic building. And then we're going to jump into the nuts and bolts of the exterior restoration and repair, uh, which, which focus on the, the facade and, and windows. So, J, uh, so Julie, why don't you get us started with, with the history of the building and let me, uh, let me give you some remote control here. Thanks, Logan. Well, with anything in preservation, when we look at the history, we need to look back in order to go forward. 
Let's see if I have control. Oh, there we go. Uh, so going back to 1903, the Ford Motor Company began manufacturing automobiles in Detroit, Michigan. By 1909, they had come up with the Model T. And the popularity of that brought, led to the introduction of branch assembly plants. And Indianapolis was selected as a regional hub in the United States. In 1915, we had our own Ford assembly plant located on East Washington Street. In the 1920s, uh, there was a couple one-story additions on the rear. They were for car delivery or car testing. And the Great Depression unfortunately led to a halt in the assembly process and the plant closed in 1932. Ford utilized architect John Graham to design the majority of their assembly plants. Now he used a kit of parts, almost like uh, an assembly line for automobiles to create the various assembly plants throughout the United States and Canada. The United States had 30 hubs with three in Canada. You can see the variety on the side there and they spanned from all ends of the United States, from the west with Seattle to Buffalo, New York in the northeast, down south to Atlanta. And if you look at these buildings, you can see that signature style coming out. And then our very own building in Indianapolis in the Midwest. As I mentioned, this had a signature style. Uh, the buildings, the primary elevation was clad in terracotta and brick. The structure is a cast in place concrete system. And then rolled steel windows, which became popular around the turn of the century, offered many amenities such as 60% glass envelope, um, they did this on all elevations and then added this monitor feature, which is shown in this structure, that had clear story windows and skylights. This central atrium that you see allowed for a rail spur to enter the building with rail cars coming directly inside to deliver parts and pieces. This little map shows you where the rail spur entered. Another aspect of the um, assembly plants was to actually have a showroom and service station on the front. After Ford left the building, it continued to have a useful life. In 1942, the PR Mallory Company, which was a manufacturer of metallurgical, electrical, and batteries, uh, utilized the facility. Uh, PR Mallory later became Duracell, which is a more recognizable name. In 1958, the Western Electric Company, which developed telephone instruments, took over the plant. And from 1967 to the 90s, it was used for education. There was technical institutes, a high school, uh, a vocational technical college. And during that time, our own Ford assembly plant became listed on the National Register of Historic Places under Indianapolis's automotive, Automobile Industry the Thematic District. Sorry, that's a mouthful. In the 2000s, it was used by the Indianapolis Public Schools for storage. During that time frame, there's been several alterations. The skylights were covered, the atrium was infilled, the windows were removed, as was the terracotta cornice. But it came back to life in 2020 as the assembly. And I'll let JB talk about the redevelopment concepts.
All righty. Thank you, Julie. I uh, appreciate the introduction. So, uh, yeah, kind of like the slide, um, you know, list here avoiding a compactor. Uh, you know, as a company, we have had a history of salvaging some old buildings, um, number of schools, um, old uh, plants or some sort of industrial use. This one in particular being an assembly plant for Ford. So uh, we had a number of items um, really that we kind of had to focus on and consider going through this project uh, for us. Um, oddly enough, our attention to this building really didn't start until we needed to move offices. Uh, kind of as, as simple as that, we were growing as a company. Uh, we're now up to about 250 employees with about 80 folks here in Indianapolis. And we had uh, people in three different office spaces, one of which we owned, two of which we did not. And we really were looking for a, a campus or somewhere uh, for us to really have our, our company headquartered. So we wanted to stay in downtown Indy. Uh, we had looked at a number of buildings for office space to lease from. Uh, however, being a, a developer, an owner, a manager of properties, uh, it's kind of hard for us not to live and work in our own buildings. So um, that's really what turned our attention to this building. At the time, uh, IPS owned it, the public school system here in town, and they had this out for an RFP for, for sale. So we have purchased a number of properties from IPS previously. Uh, I remember walking through this building for the very first time and we were going through the, uh, the bid process and the ultimate purchase of the building. Um, I think that was back in 2016, 2017. So it's been quite some time now. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in this building before and after. Uh, my office here right now, I'm in, I'm in the four building. As we speak, we moved in here in June of 2020. So, uh, you know, for us, um, this really is a master development. Uh, this building has a lot of character, a lot of history, uh, particularly local and national. And that was really attractive for us. It was definitely a challenge. Um, definitely takes a, a large amount of time and energy to do these projects versus a new construction build. But we really felt that this was gonna add to uh, East Washington Street to the east side of Indianapolis. The development that we have also done out here uh, previously and other folks have also uh, been engaged in. So we are proud to uh, now call this home. Um, you know, for us, uh, we wanted to keep as many things as we could. Uh, Julie kind of mentioned the windows there a few minutes ago, but um, there were still some, you know, historic doors, original doors that were in place. The railroad tracks are actually still here um, out back on the south side of the building. Uh, the brick uh, that maintained on the, on the uh, facade, we, we kept as much as we possibly could. The windows were beyond repair or just simply didn't exist. They were uh, blocked in with CMU or they were painted over. Um, so we had a lot of uh, kind of visions versus what was reality. Um, some challenges, you know, we, we primarily focused on multifamily, but we needed some office space as well. So uh, we wanted to fit our office in here, but also get a unit count uh, from a multifamily perspective um, that made the deal work financially and made it feasible. So, you know, for us, and I'm having some technical difficulties on my end right now, I'll give you one moment. Uh, for us, getting uh, a unit count in here in the building, um, that, that made sense uh, for us uh, to make it work with our lender and investors uh, was incredibly important. And Logan, can you help me go backwards? Sorry. There we go. Um, and to do that, we needed to open up the atrium. Uh, the pictures that you saw from Julie before uh, included kind of a wide open atrium feel, but those were actually uh, blocked over with concrete in the 20s. And Ford used this building as storage once they stopped assembling Model Ts. So we ended up um, drilling down two atriums. So if you were to look down at this building now, you'd see a figure eight. Uh, and that's how we got some natural light into the building, both for us as an office user and for our tenants. Uh, in their apartment um, units. So um, there was kind of that uh, feasibility constraint. We also had a, a facade that Logan will touch on uh, that was crumbling in our hands uh, kind of during construction. And it's 100 years old. It's very reasonable uh, to expect the buildings not to be in perfect condition, especially, you know, living here in the Midwest. Um, so we did have to kind of battle that. And at the, you know, the start of the project, we, we had some environmental abatement for lead and asbestos in the building. Uh, this site is also in the state cleanup program prior to our purchase. Um, so there is some ongoing testing just with regards to um, the underground water that is really throughout the east side in this neighborhood. So um, a number of different factors, a number of different parties interested in this project, again, just kind of goes to the team we needed 
uh, to get this one across the finish line. So like I mentioned before, for us, um, our headquarters was kind of to the uh, north there um, over by the weight apartments that we completed uh, in 2019, 2020. And we we're looking to stay downtown. So uh, we, we moved east uh, just outside the interstate where we are today at the existing building. Um, here you can kind of see some of the uh, build out for us on the first floor. The photo on the left is our kind of main entryway. If you were to come walk in the office right this moment, this is what you'd walk into. Um, that car you see there, I, I believe that was in fact assembled here in this building. It was donated to us um, and we're so incredibly happy and proud to have that, you know, sitting literally when you walk right in the building. Um, the kind of theme was to keep this white with some black metal and steel throughout the, uh, the building you'll see in some of these photos. Then the photo on the right, um, you know, you can see we left the exposed concrete. Uh, it's, it's original. There was some patchwork that was done, but we did not go through and make it one consistent uniform new color or coat. Uh, you can definitely see and, and, and you know, notice that uh, this concrete's not perfect, which uh, kind of adds to, a, you know, a level of respect we have for the history of this building. Um, we left the exposed duct work in the ceilings, as you can see. Um, that floor to floor height, I believe, is roughly 16 feet, 15 to 16 feet, and really helps us with our open uh, office concept. Uh, we actually kind of designed the space um, more square footage than we needed. Uh, ended up being helpful with COVID, uh, but we, you know, we did this design pre-COVID. We just kind of got lucky with that. But wanted an open office feel. Having the big natural or the big windows with natural light also helps that. Um, this next photo here, this is actually up on the fifth floor and kind of goes to the style and design of the unit finishes, uh, the color scheme we have for all the units. And this is our amenity space in particular. So if you were to come here, go up on the fifth floor, um, you would have great views of downtown. This particular room itself on the fifth floor faces west towards downtown. It's a great view of Lucas Oil uh, and all of the buildings downtown Indianapolis. So this is free to charge for rent. It's a great open space for tenants, excuse me, great open space uh, to have in the property. And, um, you know, again, trying to pay some more uh, homage to the history of the city in, in this building. Uh, we were able to save a number of doors that we found. Um, this one came from the fourth floor, I believe. And we actually put these um, barn door style. So these slide, they're incredibly heavy. Um, but we made it work. Uh, we got the brackets in place. So we have these on our focus rooms. So if someone's working out in the open, needs to have a private phone call, can hop in one of these rooms and either bring their computer or phone in there. And then we also named our conference rooms um, a little bit after some, some racing here in the city and some companies that have had a lot to do with uh, cars and manufacturing engines and the Indy 500. So uh, our conference rooms, some you know, monumental, uh, Allison Fisher Room, the Circle City. We have a number of names like that. And you can also see that this kind of mirrors the Ford logo. Um, you know, Ford really didn't own the building or have much to do with it after the 30s. But again, they were the first ones here and they built it. So um, we kind of incorporated that as much as we could uh, throughout the project. And this is a view looking from the first floor up into these two atriums that I mentioned that we had to drill through uh, and demolish. So those windows, when we bought the building, they really didn't exist. Um, they were either knocked out and covered with metal or they were just simply painted over, um, almost like a tar. Um, so what we did is we, we were able to kind of rip those out, replace those windows, bring in natural light and create this atrium. Uh, the windows that you see kind of on the side, those are units, those are apartment units. Uh, that's the natural light that gets into those units that are inside of the donut. Um, those windows are not operable. Uh, but we did still have a barrier kind of between our office and the folks above and the, the windows above with our office space. And then the photo on the right, uh, that is actually the original crane in the building that would move and kind of slide north and south at the property to pick up Model Ts, to pick up the vehicle to the fourth floor, move it to the third, to the second, and ultimately to the first. I'm not exactly sure uh, if upholstery was done on the fourth and the windows were added on the third, what exactly was put where. Um, that was kind of the idea is that these were assembled and brought down and then eventually stored in the garages that were built in the 20s. So definitely a cool feature here. Um, and, and again, just helps us get natural light into the building. So um, that's kind of, you know, I think part of my segment here, I'll pass it off to Logan. 
Um, his team at WJE was, was great to work with. Um, the facade itself, when you look at it, the idea was try to get it as much as possible to what it was 100 years ago. Uh, they did a great job assisting us in that. And uh, if you haven't had a chance, please drive by. Feel free to stop by, walk in the front door. Um, it's definitely a, a building we're very proud of. Thanks, JV. Uh, and and now, now we're going to talk some nuts and bolts of, of that exterior restoration. Um, and what we're going to talk about with the exterior race, uh, restoration is that there's many things we could talk about, but I'm trying, what we're going to boil it down to is, is three um, areas that we focused our repairs um, on. And, and the first one is the east and west facades of the building are, are exposed concrete. And you can see that in, in the picture labeled number one. The second topic we're going to focus on is, is the south gable of the building, which is in the photo number two. And then, and then finally, uh, Julie and I will talk about the windows and the north facade cornice. Um, again, JB touched on it. There is a, there's a lot of work to do on this building. And, and the facade project alone was, was a mega project for, for them and for us, to be honest. So, um, so the exterior concrete repair, you know, this, this is what it looked like when, when TWG took ownership and we started doing our assessments. And so you can see um, that, there, that up close, you start to see a lot of deterioration of the concrete. Um, and most of that deterioration uh, resulted from uh, corrosion related distress of the original uh, reinforcing steel in, in the concrete, exposed concrete frame. But there were also um, some material de deterioration due to freeze thaw and exposure over time as well. Um, and, and so the, the repair design for the exterior concrete are, are pretty typical exterior vertical, uh, vertical repairs. Um, for those of you listening that are in the industry, these, these details look pretty similar to, uh, pretty familiar to you. Um, however, there was some challenges with with doing the window openings because a lot of the concrete repair were at the heads and sills of the window and required um, particular attention to make sure the rough opening of the window matched the new window units that had been ordered before the concrete repairs were complete. So there was a, there was a lot of tolerance uh, that needed to be paid attention to when doing concrete repairs around the window. Now on this project, um, the, something, something unique happened on this project because typically in, in our experience on, on exterior concrete repair projects for, for existing buildings, we, we go with the tried and true form and pour repair. Um, but on this project, um, it actually ended up being a, a, a decent candidate for shot creek repair, which ultimately saved TWG quite a bit of time. Uh, the difference between these two repair methods um, the, 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 both repair methods require preparation of the, of the substrate and then placement of the new concrete repair material. Um, but there's some subtle differences between these two repair methods. The, the, the preparation is virtually the same for both form and poured repairs and shot crit repairs. We have to identify the deteriorate concrete. We got to remove the deteriorate concrete and some uh, sound concrete to make sure we get it deep enough and sound enough. Um, and then you prepare the concrete surfaces with sandblasting or abrasive blasting to get good bond with the new concrete repair material. And you also repair, the, uh, repair and prepare the reinforcing that's existing. And that, that requires sandblasting and coating with, with corrosion inhibiting coatings so, so as to prevent future distress from corrosion occurring. But in the placement is where these two methods start to diverge a little bit and how, and how they generally are are done. On the form and pour side, you form up the repair area with plywood, you, you nail it or screw it into the uh, substrate, and then you provide these little um, bird mouths is what we call them, where you, where you pour the concrete into that formed repair. And then you have to wait a little while before you remove those forms for the concrete to cure and, and develop strength. And then, and then you have to have the contractor come back and remove those forms. So, so there's, there's more labor involved in, in the placement side on form and pour repairs um, that, that you don't have with the shot crate repairs. And the shot crate side of things, um, after the preparation of the surface is complete, um, you, you can essentially shoot concrete into the repair area 
and then shape it with trowels and, and straight edges. And then you apply a, a, um, a surface sealer or a surface curing compound to, uh, to let the concrete cure. And so there's not the effort after the fact of removing the forms, which, which saves a lot of time. Um, but, but it's all not all rosy because in, in our experience, there's some risks associated with going with the shot crew repair on a vertical application of a building versus the foreman poured repair. And, and those risks are what I call risk of installation. On the foreman pour side of things, um, you're often using a pre-blended, pre-bagged concrete repair mix that you are proportioning exactly to how the directions tell you how to mix the concrete. And then you're pouring it into place and you have these nice um, stiff forms that hold the concrete in place and give you nice straight edges. On the shot on the shotcrete side of side of things, you're proportioning thing uh, the the constituents of the concrete repair material into a, a bat that then shoots the concrete into the repair area um, uh, with a hose, and and so it's a little bit more of an art form on the shotcrete repair side of things. Not to say that you um, you can't achieve similar results with both methods, but the shotcrete side of things requires more um, qualified uh, contractors to implement successfully, and that and that's what I that's why I term it the the risk of installation is that there's there's more risk that if you have somebody that maybe new to it or or doesn't have a lot of experience with shotcrete that it, it may be riskier to install. So getting back into the the preparation, kind of showing you the sequence of steps on this building. The first step is to identify all the concrete repairs. And this isn't graffiti. This is, this is us doing an assessment, sounding the areas and identifying areas of the concrete facade that need to be repaired. Um, and, and some of these areas grew beyond the initial assessment of, of what we thought needed to be repaired. Because as you, as you start to demo out the, the unsound concrete, some more tends to loosen up just outside that area. So, so, um, so it, it probably even grew beyond what what you see in this in this photo. Uh, here's here's the form and pour method where um, you have a, a a tradesman installing the forms, and then you see the the pour uh, the the uh, concrete placement ports or the bird mouse that we call them, where you place the concrete into the form area, you vibrate it in there, and then and then you strip the forms after the concrete cured. On the shotcrete side of things, this is what you're looking at with shotcrete placement. This is actually mock-ups we did to make sure that we could place the shotcrete with, uh, within all the details that were expected for the project. And what you, what you might notice in the left-hand photo here is that there's quite a bit of mess that ha happens with shotcrete, which is one of the other reasons that it's not often used um, on existing buildings because most of the time buildings are occupied and, and creating this kind of a mess makes, uh, frustrates occupants often. And, and, you know, and then they call JB and, and PWG and complain about it. Um, and so oftentimes that's a consideration that, that you, would, you wouldn't use shotcrete on existing buildings. However, in this case, the building was vacant under complete construction. So um, there wasn't that concern of, of frustrating occupants with the mess. Um, and, and it actually uh, it became a, a viable option for, for shot creek placement on this building. Um, and then just, just to kind of show the process in a little bit more detail of the shot creek, um, on the left, on the right hand side of this uh, slide, you can see um, in the lift, they're placing the concrete. You have a, a hose that comes all the way down to the apparatus, which is pumping the concrete to the nozzle. Um, and, and that nozzle man, it has to be a pretty qualified and experienced person to, to do, uh, place the shot crate in appropriate size lifts and, um, and, 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 uh, and make sure there's no void. And then on the bottom left hand side of this photo, the next step in the process is you have another tradesman, um, shape and, and, uh, cut the, the shot crate to make sure that it, um, you know, it, it's smooth and, and it, it's, it's profile matched as the, adjacent concrete and then in the top left photo you can see um, you can see that 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 the a curing compound has been applied to the shot creek repair areas to, to help it cure 
So, so the second topic we're going to talk about with the exterior facade repair is the south gable. Um, and despite the fact that it's a relatively small part of the facade, it, it proved to be one of the one of the more challenging parts of the of the repair. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that the parapet um, has essentially been falling off. Um, and it was really interesting as a as an engineer to you know to see how they built this thing a hundred years ago and the design that they they did. This design was actually pretty in, in innovative at the time um, because they kind of mixed masonry, uh, mass masonry walls with reinforced concrete concepts and actually reinforced the parapet wall with these um, with the uh, reinforcing bars that were um, that were embedded in the concrete slab of the roof. Um, it worked. It, it was it was a great idea. Worked well for many decades, I'm sure. But then, but parapets are very exposed on most buildings, and um, and and get get a lot of water. And so, when that unprotected steel in the in the brick parapet um, was exposed to water, it started to corrode and and caused a lot of issues. And a lot of these um, reinforcing bars were were essentially gone um, and caused caused uh, some of this brick to fall off. So. So um, knowing that that was a systemic issue on the parapets, we had to recommend the tough decision of, of uh, rebuilding the parapets on the south facade. The other big challenge with the south gable was the two um, girders or, or window lintels on the south facade that uh, were supporting essentially the entire uh, south gable brick. Um, and you can see I've highlighted the two beams or girders um, at this location, um, and you know, from from the outside, you know, yeah, there's some displaced brick, and and yeah, you know, it 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 it, it needs some love, but but we didn't really know how significantly distressed and and compromised this structure, these structural beams were until we did the inspection openings that you can see uh, in this photo, and what we found was that the, the steel girders. Yeah, they, they were corroded, and and there was quite a bit of section loss, um, and, and and you know maybe we could have worked with that, but the significant thing that we found was that the bearing seats or the the corbels that were supporting this girder were were severely compromised, and you could actually once we started to kind of demo out the brick, you could see that the 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 beam was actually rotating out, um, which which gave us great concern of the stability of this beam and the south gable. And unfortunately, the, the only way to really repair it was we had to, um, you know, disassemble the south gable to, uh, you know, repair that corbel to provide a better seat for it. The other thing we saw with the with the, the upper uh, beam, which was, a, which was a smaller beam, a shorter span, um, but it had corro it had significant corrosion and section loss of the web of it of the beam uh, or the vertical portion of the beam um, that had started to in in localized areas had started to buckle a little bit, which is an indication that um, the demand on the beam has is is starting to uh, exceed the the existing uh, capacity of what steel was remaining. Um, after so after we made the recommendation to TWG to that hey we you know unfortunately we think we got to rebuild this south gable we felt uh very um i guess uh it was we felt confident in our decision after we saw the condition of the corbel this this is that corbel that that beam was sitting on you can see some of the reinforcing steel that's that's basically holding that corbel back to the structure is severely deteriorated um, so after seeing this, you know, it was it was no question that it was the right decision, uh, despite how difficult and and, um, and and challenging it was. So this is what that south gable looked like after uh, disassembly of the parapets and the, and the south gable, um, and um, the design of the replacement of that south gable. We we kind of vacillated back and forth between um, and. It, Building up sections of steel beams to replace those girders, or uh, precast concrete uh, girders, and we ended up arriving at precast concrete girders because we could, we felt like the, it would be a little bit more cost efficient, and and it would provide um, 
greater opportunity to get the the section we needed of that of those girders to support the the high demand at this south gable um, because again these girders are spanning about 30 feet a little actually more than 30 feet to to bridge that window opening and you have a lot of masonry stacked up on top of it and furthermore the thing that we had to consider when redesigning this girder is we had to up we had to um, consider current uh, code demands for lateral uh, wind and seismic loads on the girder, which weren't considered back in, in the 19 teens when this was originally built. So that those demands actually increased uh, the section we needed to make, make the beam work over this opening. Um, and in section on the left-hand side here, you, you can see in the orange highlight uh, that, that we, we accommodated those increased wind and seismic demands by adding flanges on the top and bottom of the beam um, that were uh, that gave it more uh, rotational stiffness and lateral uh, stiffness capacity and capacity for those lateral loads. On the right hand side is the detail for the re repair of the corbel to which the beam sits on um, and the, the concept we used for repairing the corbel was essentially uh, dialing in uh, new epoxy anchored uh, reinforcing to kind of anchor back our new corbel section to the existing structure. And then we had to add in um, some additional reinforcing and a steel plate to, for the bearing of, of the new girder on top of it. Uh, this corbel, there's only two of them on this building and, and they're literally probably three or four feet long and a foot wide and a foot deep. Um, but but the, these corbels were, um, as, as an engineer, they're, they're one of the things that, you know, you wanna make sure we get this right because you got a whole gable sitting on these things. And, and um, you can see in the bottom right hand uh, photo and the top left right hand photo that there's quite a bit of steel that we had to put in there to um, resolve the capacity of the corbel for, to support those girders. And so making sure that steel was placed in the proper spot, making sure that we, the, the concrete, um, you know, was consolidated within that congested amount of steel. Uh, we're, all, we're all concerns that we, we were very diligent about with TWG to make sure that we got, um, got it right. Um, and uh, once those were poured and uh, you know, that, was, that was a big milestone, even though there were only two, two of them on the project. So this photo shows um, the in progress rebuilding of the South Gable. Um, and the, the girders that are in place, and you can see the CMU backup wall that's supported off those girders. And then the bottom girder has a little shelf angle that supports the brick cladding that was built over top of it. Uh, this is another in progress shot showing you uh, the, the parapets are, are essentially rebuilt. There's a little, a little spot that still needed a little bit more work. And then the, par the, the south gable is essentially rebuilt at this point as well. One of the sidebar stories of the South Gable is um, the original copings on the parapet and in the, in the top of the South Gable were actually, um, were, they were constructed as a, a poured in place uh, concrete coping that was, you know, the entire length of the parapet. So we uh, worked with TWG and worked with the contractor to try to replicate the look of that uh, concrete coping by um, get, you know, doing a few samples and mock-ups to really get a, that exposed aggregate look. And, and our, our assumption is that um, when they originally built these um, uh, copings, that they were trying to replicate um, the look of Indiana limestone with the concrete they used. Because again, like Julie said earlier, they were really experimenting and trying new innovative things with concrete when they were building these assembly plants. Uh, and so this just shows uh, uh, again, it's it's a relatively a simplistic uh, part of the facade, but it, a lot of effort, a lot of time, and a lot of uh, uh, analysis went into making sure that this this uh, south facade was uh, rebuilt and and will last many many years. And now we'll turn our focus uh, to to the north facade, um, and 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 the effort it took. To uh, to restore and 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 uh, rebuild the north facade, and just as a reminder um, of what the historic 
uh, facade originally looked like. Um, you know, this is a photo that Julie shared earlier. And, and a couple of things to point out as, as we're going through our slides here is, is note the windows um, and note the cornice at the top of the building that were original to the building as we go through this. Of course, this is what we were um, started with when TWG bought the building or got possession of the building and, and hired us to, to evaluate and, and start repair design. Um, and so with that, I will, uh, I'll turn it to, uh, I'll turn it to Julie to talk about windows next. Thanks, Logan. Well, uh, Logan kind of went through these photos before, but you can see the the historic, the original, uh, what we inherited, and what we have after. And with any, oop, let's see. Oh, oh, Logan, can you go backward one? Thank you. So with any window project, you have to start with what you have, or sometimes what you don't have to figure out what you need. Um, the windows, had many challenges. Uh, they were rolled steel windows, which have a very narrow sight line, approximately one and a half inches for frames, even more slender for the muttons. Um, we had the incredible large size of the windows. The average window measured about 21 feet wide by 12 feet tall. As you saw with on the south facade, um, that window measured approximately 30 feet wide by nine feet tall. So we had to deal with all of those. We had a variety of types of windows to contend with. And we also were integrating new doors. Beyond that, we had to look at wind loads and structure. Um, in order to get the correct fit, we coordinated closely with a specific window manufacturer that specializes in the simulated steel sash look. We also uh, coordinated with the SHPO and Logan helped out quite a bit with our structural issues on these doors or on these windows. Let's see. Um, as we mentioned earlier, there is about 60% of the envelope was glass, as you can see in this interior photo at the top. And I think we did a pretty good job going back to what originally was the aesthetic of the building. Let's see. The skylights were also another challenge. Um, as JB mentioned, they were <laughs> left in some semblance, but most of it was deteriorate, deteriorated beyond reuse. These were located in what we call the monitor. So the skylights paraded down the elevations in this location with clear stories windows here, which you see a clear story and the remnant of the skylights. In, I think, approximately 1956, these were covered over. They used steel channels to between the skylights and then steel um, framing above to create a new roof to cover them all up. That roof stayed in place and we had to work with that overbuild with the installation of new skylights. At this time, we did not reopen all of them, but only the ones over the atrium. So you can see in this diagram here where these were located. So we did about a third of the skylights. Um, with anything, we cannot build as they did in the past. We had to work with new curb heights in order to maintain a warranty on these new skylights. But I think uh, we succeeded in that and I will turn it back over to Logan to talk about the cornice. So, so the final topic we're going to talk about is, is the uh, north facade cornice and, and replicating the original one. Um, there, there, was, there was quite a bit of uh, other masonry and terracotta repair work on the north facade, 
but for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus on the cornice. Um, and, um, you know, as we were talking about earlier, you know, there was a metal panel up here originally. Um, and, and so as part of our investigation, we wanted to know how much of the corn, original cornice was left. So we removed, or TWG removed the metal panel so that we could get up there and evaluate it. And, and, and to our surprise and, and, and thank goodness, a lot of the arch terracotta uh, at the, below the cornice, but above the top floor windows remained and remained in pretty darn good condition uh, to build off of. So, so that was one um, positive surprise out of this that, um, that really kind of helped uh, steer the way for, um, for the cornice. Uh, the, the, the concept we came up with initially for the cornice re replication was um, using a, 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 you know, a GFRC uh, panelized cornice system, which is, which is indicated on the right-hand side of this drawing. Uh, and, and some of you may ask, well, if it, if it was originally terracotta, why are we going with GFRC? Um, GFRC is, is a, a common uh, a material used to replicate terracotta that's sympathetic with terracotta. Uh, most of the time in historic preservation, we want to go back with the original materials, but GFRC is commonly used as a, as a alternative material in historic preservation for terracotta. But, but the real reason uh, is because it's not our first test drive with GFRC cornices and replicating them. Um, this is actually a project that our company did in Chicago, it's a Marquette building. And similar to the Ford building, the Marquette building in Chicago had its cornice removed at some point during the life of the building, um, which, which really just made it look like a big box and, and took away a lot of the character of it. But, but WJE along with other uh, partners were, were hired to replicate it. And the benefit of a GFRC panelized cornice is that you can essentially uh, replicate a cornice that had many units and, 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 sh and decrease the number of units you need to fabricate to replicate the cornice. And, and so here's an example, and you can kind of see the, the left-hand photo, there's, there's a, a gentleman in the, the bottom right of that photo for scale, um, but you can replicate a, a, a fairly large cornice with GFRC with some strong back framing. The other big benefit of GFRC for replicating cornice is you can actually just kind of lift them up into place, set them in place, and then from the ground, you know, they, they look essentially part of the building without, uh, and, and many folks might not even notice that it's GFRC versus terracotta, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side of the nearly complete photo of the Marquette building cornice replacement. So that was kind of the concept we were working off of based on our previous experience. Of course, the four building wasn't nearly as big and, and there were some modifications that we made to the concepts to make sure we got the proportions right and, and Julian ratio helped a lot with uh, making sure we got the proportions right and, and getting the dentaline and the, and the joint spacings correct. Um, so this is ultimately near complete concept for the replicated cornice. Um, obviously we didn't make the entire parapet a panelized system, but, but the cornice itself was, uh, was panelized and we used uh, J-hook type uh, connections to, to secure that in place. And then here's an example, here's a detail and plan. You had basically two J-hook type connections per panel. And then at the corner, we had to get a little creative to make sure we resolved um, the corner loads into the parapet backup wall. Another big aspect of the GFRC cornice was working with the GFRC manufacturer in the shop drawing phase to make sure that all our, all our dimensions were accurate, to make sure we had joint layouts accurate within each panel so that they lined up from panel to panel and, and had the appropriate spacing. And then again, the dentals were a big deal because there are some jogs back and forth in, uh, in and out of plane of the parapet um, for the building. So, so making sure we resolve the spacing of the dentals is really important in the panel. Um, the other thing that we did before we, we, uh, we, we uh, released the fabricator to start fabricating is we actually made some mock-ups and TWG had a smart idea of, of, well, hey, we don't need to make a GFRC mock-up. Maybe we just have one of our carpentry uh, subs uh, make a mock-up of it to just give us the shape and profile. And so they made this up with um, one of their carpenters 
with some basically insulation and plywood to make sure we get the profile. And this was really helpful for Julie and I so that we could, oh, you know, this, you know, this is uh, the proportions seem a little off here and it kind of looks like it's our, our cornice has buck teeth there. So, um, so it was really helpful for us to kind of uh, make sure we had it right in the shop drawings before, um, before we released them for fabrication. Uh, and then the other the other part of it was getting good color match. Again, what, you know, you clean one of the existing uh, terracotta units, and then you get a bunch of color samples from the manufacturer uh, to make sure that we're getting a good match to a cleaned terracotta surface as opposed to a dirty one. So we we had a number of samples to make sure we were getting the right color. And so this is the Cornish units as it was shipped out. Again, on the left hand side, you can see. The, uh, the 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 dowels in the back side of the corners that anchor it to the parapet, and then with the dentals, um, you know, we were so concerned about the spacing of them that we actually, the manufacturer decided that hey, we're just going to make the dentals separate from the the panelized corners, and then they can post install them to make sure they have the right spacing on the facade. And so here's the mock-up of the GFRC panels going in place. Um, again, you can see the false joints there that really increase the efficiency of reinstalling and replicating this cornice because instead of having seven different terracotta units that you have to install one by one and then anchor them back one by one, you have one unit that accommodates the seven units with, with, uh, with false joints. Um, and then here's, here's, here's the anchors and the nuts and bolts in place. Um, again, it's, it's relatively simple. This is a common detail for uh, terracotta, hung terracotta units. Uh, and we just kind of modified it and, and beefed it up a little bit to support the, the larger GFRC units. So as we, uh, as we, as we kind of take our final lap here, uh, I just want to show some uh, before and after photos and then we'll open up for some questions. So, um, you know, here's, here's the south facade. Um, you know, the, the original look on the right hand side with the train spur, com uh, the, uh, the rail spur coming inside, and then the after photo uh, on the left. Um, here, here's kind of the, the south, or, uh, yeah, the, the north uh, west corner of the building and the before photo when TWG took ownership and, and the after on the left. And then here's kind of the main facade with that cornice uh, in place and all the windows um, in place. And then finally, just just the the uh, the winter circle here is is uh, the original photo on the right, and and where we ended up on the left. And, and I, I'd have to say I I think TWG did a really good job bringing this building back to life. So my final thought is is just like the any any car pit crews, um, you know, there was a lot of team members on this that that kept this project running, um, and uh, I, you know I know I'm very proud to be a part of this team, and I'm I'm grateful for uh, TUG putting a, a great design team together, and a lot of people deserve a lot of credit for this. So with that will open up the questions, Suzanne. Sure, great. Uh, you know, I'm kind of glad I hadn't seen those photographs before we did that before tour because uh, a little scary about the condition that it was in. Um, before we go to questions, just I got to put it a quick commercial before everybody leaves. Um, make sure you turn tune in on June 3rd for a talk that we're doing on the um, American Mall, and you can find out more about that on our website. And also, if you're really into automotive history, look into our Indiana Automotive Group, which you may have seen in the chat, Marsh Davis, our president noted that they helped uh, to get that car, that Model T that's in there. And of course, Father's Day is coming up. So think about Indiana Landmarks and Indiana Automotive uh, memberships as gifts. So we've got quite a few questions. Um, let's jump into those. I'm gonna try to take care of everybody's, but one question that keeps coming up is with the conversion of a factory to residential, you run into a lot of things like insulation and HVAC, and then also um, the, the windows and your conservation um, that, you know, may have not been such an issue with, with the factory. So can somebody address how you uh, took care of some of those things? I will, JB, you wanna, yeah, you wanna start, JB? I'll attempt to address that. So some of our biggest concerns are just wide open spaces. So, you know, on floors two and three, 
Um, you know, we have relatively manageable size units and the windows that we put in, um, they're, they're modern. They're not, you know, 40, 50 years old. So that um, heat, heating and cooling is, is definitely manageable. Um, our hallway widths in some of the schools we've done, the hallways are 10 and 12 feet wide and we have to heat and cool that. And in Indiana, that's really tough. It's really expensive. We don't have that as much here. Uh, we, we did a, a pretty good job with our architect team inside the building to try to make this as efficient as possible. We have some kind of goofy shaped units. The fourth floor units, there are some that have 15, 16 plus foot tall ceilings. And in some of those uh, utility bills are more than we would prefer. Um, usually only in extreme temperature months. Uh, if you have really, really cold or really, really hot, um, usually one or two months out of the year. But for the most part, it's really our own office space that we've had issues with just because we have about 40,000 square feet of just this wide open, tall uh, space with concrete windows. And it gets really hot during the day but when the blinds go down um, or the sun goes away, it kind of cools off. So uh, for us, we're still actually kind of fine tuning that a little bit with our central HVAC. Uh, each unit has its own split system. Um, condensers are on the roof. They're on the east side of the roof, though. You can't really see that when you're on the patio space looking towards downtown. So uh, a lot of coordination with our MEP. It's not a perfect science. It's not as efficient as a new building. Uh, I'm not going to try to deny that. Um, but we, we, we did try to at least design uh, interior uh, units and in, in, um, office spaces around that the best we could. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, yeah, and that's one reason we did not open all the skylights is if you had those <laughs> right above your unit, you would be baking all day long. <laughs> all the windows, of course, are, you know, contemporary units with insulated glass. So that adds to uh, mitigating the heat gain. Uh, the skylights we used, we put a fret pattern on it so it would not be as intense as just a clear glass. But yes, with 60% of the envelope being glazing, there's going to be a lot of heat load on that building. We had a couple of people ask uh, or say they noticed that the board name didn't go back up on the building. Um, any thoughts by, behind, you know, why you didn't do that or? So um, it sounds almost too simple, but we need Ford's approval to do that. Oh. Um, so we... I haven't had any luck reaching out to anyone with that. We can't just stick their name on there. It kind of insinuates they own it or have some, you know, component with the building. Uh, we have a car in there, uh, but it's tagging their name back on the top. We just haven't been successful uh, in getting it to that point. I'm sure there's a copyright on that font too. So you have to be careful with that. Um, what did you do with the old coal powered furnace pit? So that is all still there. Um, it was kind of in two, there were two kind of boiler rooms. There was one in the original footprint of the building. And then there was one that was almost built, an extra house was built on the back. That back piece just south of the building has been removed and demoed. But uh, we've just locked the door to the old uh, furnace in the basement. I've been down there a number of times. Uh, if you like scary movies, you might love it. I personally, it terrifies me. It is an absolutely huge, uh, huge room uh, with not a lot of light. The old boilers are still there, uh, but it's, we just, uh, we have a door that's locked. You can't get down there. We're not using it actively, but it does exist. That might replace our catacombs tours. I don't know. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Everybody likes to see a basement. Um, you know, I think it's really great what you showed is that historic preservation also includes new materials. So it's not, you know, you can you can use things like the GFRC and, and the new windows and still preserve something. And most importantly, too, this was a tax credit project, correct? So it was in the sense of historic tax credits, yes. Yes, yes, historic tax credit um, project. So you're using the Secretary of the Interior's guidelines and working with our State Historic Preservation Office. And uh, for those of you that get land emails from landmarks, from time to time, you'll see us making an appeal for lobbying your legislators to save that historic tax credit because it does so much for helping turn around buildings like this. Um, so we're really glad that you were able to take advantage of that. Um, let's see, a couple other questions. I assume you did, did you do tech pointing on the full building? Yeah, the, the, essentially 
the entire uh, brick facades were repointed. Uh, they were they were just they were ready. They were ready for it. And we did coordinate with uh, Ashley Thomas at Chippo with that again to get the correct color, to get the correct tooling profile, and you know anybody who looks at it now is going to be like, "Wow, that's bright." But based on the mortar that we had anal analyzed, that is the correct color. It just had gotten so dirty over the years. Well, yeah. and, and, and it was previously repointed with a right. different mm -hmm. color. So, yeah, I think that's common. Sometimes it, it can be really shocking, and you realize, well, that's just how dirty it was. Um, how many? Uh, what's the square footage of the the total building? So the total building is roughly two hundred thousand square feet. That includes uh, the original four building itself. The floor plates are 40,000 square feet. So 160 for the original building. And then roughly another 40,000 square foot if you add on the two garage spaces and the kind of back storage area of the building. So 200,000 square feet, uh, total project cost right at $39 million. That includes land, soft costs, and all the hard cost construction as well. And is it all market rate housing or is there, are there any affordable units? Nope. So this is a mixed income property. Uh, we have 132 apartment units. 51% of those are at 80% AMI. Uh, that's really defined as workforce housing. And then the 49% balance are market rate. So uh, we do not have uh, affordable tax credits on this property. We made that commitment to the city uh, and to the state in, in doing our, uh, our deal. But we had a number of financial partners on this project from a financial standpoint, incredibly unique uh, but yes, we, we do have uh, mixed incomes here. That's great. I'm going to take two. We have two last questions. Um, do you have parking, on-site parking for the residents? We've got a, a combination of, of, of park. We've got uh, roughly 46 garage spaces in the steel and wood frame garage buildings that were built in the 20s. Uh, we have a number of spaces out front in the surface lot you'll see next to our building on Washington Street. We also bought neighboring property to the west. We have surface parking for and we also own the Ivy Tech building that's adjacent east to us. Across Oriental Avenue, there are four surface lots that we also own. So uh, we, we, like I said, this is a massive development. This is not just a one-off thing. Uh, we do have an affordable project that is uh, just west of here, Line Loss, that's finishing up construction right now. Um, so yes, there's, there's kind of parking throughout this whole campus of ours. And this is a question for uh, Logan, which I'm not sure if you can wrap this up quickly, but was there a need for structural intervention after reopening with the large glass windows? Uh, I, I, I guess I don't fully understand the question. Uh, can you repeat that? Um, I think maybe this person is asking when the windows were blocked up and you took the block out, was there any structural intervention that you had to do before you could put the new windows in? Uh, yeah, well, the, 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 not to the building structure, but there were a lot of concrete repairs surrounding the rough openings of the window that needed to be repaired prior to the new windows being installed. I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Well, we're right uh, just a little bit over seven o'clock. I want to thank everybody so much, our, our panelists, and um, thank you for joining us. Thanks to our Indiana Landmarks members. If you're not a member, we would love to have you help us save meaningful places and uh, revitalize communities, much like this building is doing on the east side of, of Indianapolis. So thank you all, and I hope we see you at a future program.